Which of my feelings are real? Which of the mess is me? There is only one me I've ever really liked, and she was good and awake as long as she could be. I'm your host, Thawas Prami, coming back to accompany you from Team Berto. Well, it's already the third episode, so I don't know if I'm still the new face, but anyways, your books coffee girl is here. How are you all? How's the family? How are the friends? I noticed that your smile's looking extra pretty today. Yeah, I see you. So I am present here with you with another episode, episode three of the second season of Ichigo Ichie. Ishigo Ishii, our live series where we invite initiators, activists, and instructors from all over the world to join us virtually and keep you, our audience, engaged with valuable discussions and skill-based sessions. This project is brought to you by Timberto and the Youth Exchange South to South Yes Girls Movement. Timberto is an organization where we aim to document the understanding of life through peoples learning and pass them on to your people and everyone else as an innovative, creative, and effective solution for everyone to live their best life. In case if you're wondering, Ishigo Ishii is a Japanese four-character idiom, which describes as treasuring the unrepeatable nature of a moment, usually translated as for this time only and once in a lifetime. Just like each of the moment we live is a once in a lifetime moment. We do not remember days, we remember moments. I should be happy, but instead, I feel nothing. I feel a lot of nothing these days. I've cried a few times, but mostly I'm empty as if weather, whatever makes me feel and hurt and laugh and love has been, it's like surgically removed, leaving me hollowed out like a shell. This is a quote of a character named Violet Markley from the book named All the Bright Places. I know that there are many Violets out there like this one. Might be me, might be you, might be some of you who are probably helping yourselves. Maybe some of you reached out and some of you are still seeking help. But today, here to help all of you, all of us, as much as possible in this session, we have today's guest. Lottie has fought a several years of battle of depression and an eating disorder. She became determined to destigmatize discussions around mental health through education and raising awareness at the college and in the wider community. This strong individual began her mission by organizing a 24 hour dance thon attended by 500 students and teachers and raised 3,200 pounds for the charity Mind. Lottie has given many speeches about her own mental health experiences as she speaks from the heart at school assemblies, external workshops, and more. She is also praised for her openness and candor to help break down taboos in school, especially amongst boys who are more acutely affected by mental health stigma. Lottie has helped organize a community mental health day attended by 2,000 people with more than 60 speakers. She was also appointed a school ambassador to stop stigma around mental health and spoke with senior leadership at the school to request a chance to read and review the school's policies around mental health. Her work is described as truly life-saving. In 2021, she received the Diana Legacy Award. So without further ado, please welcome the Legacy Award recipient, Lottie Leach. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I love All the Right Places, the book. Um, I read it within like two days, so glad you put that as a quote. Um, yeah, it's so nice to be here, so thank you so much for having me. It is also our pleasure and everyone's pleasure who has been watching, and we're really looking forward to your session. And again, thank you so much for taking out time to be here with us. It is yes. truly an honor, and it's truly incredible of the works you did it's truly Thank incredible you. so yeah, nice. i'm gonna leave the floor to you now i'm gonna come back to you towards the end again for a question answer session if we have any audience questions and yeah the floor is yours amazing so um my session today is um basically just going to be a rundown of kind of my story and um the things that i've learned and the things that i think um young people especially um should know about mental health um so i first want to start off with a little statistic which i'm sure many of you already know um 
but statistics show that one in four people experience um, a mental health problem each year and suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45 in the country. Um, now for me personally I think it's time that we start changing those statistics. Um, as you've said before um, my name is Lottie, I'm 20 years old um, and I'm here today to share my struggles um, with mental illness. Um, now I have quite um, an assortment of diagnosed mental health conditions. They include depression, anxiety and an eating disorder and thankfully I'm now in remission for all which is good to know. Um, according to definitions though, um, depression is characterised by persis persistent sadness and a lack of interest or pleasure in previously rewarding activities. Anxiety is defined as a feeling of unease such as worry or fear that can be mild or severe. Now when I first became ill these were the definitions my parents read. They were simple, basic, and really easy to understand but the problem I find is that these mental health conditions are not simple, basic, and I'm sure my parents will now agree, the most complex of illnesses to understand. Um, but as I was ill I had a, a school tutor um, who found an analogy that really has stuck with me throughout all my struggles and has helped me kind of put into words what I kind of couldn't understand depression as um it's a youtube video online and it's called i have a black dog his name is depression i'm so i'm sure some of you may have seen it before um but i'd like to share a few words that resonate with me and my experience um goes a little something like this um i had a black dog his name was depression whenever the black dog made an appearance i felt empty and life seemed to slow down he could surprise me with a visit for no reason or occasion when the rest of the world seemed to be enjoying life, I could only see it through the black dog. Activities that usually brought me pleasure suddenly ceased to. He liked to ruin my appetite. He chewed up my ab ability to concentrate. Doing anything or going anywhere with the black dog required superhuman strength. I was constantly worried that I would be found out, so I invested vast amounts of energy into covering him up. He loved nothing more than to, t than to wake me with highly repetitive and negative thinking. He also liked to remind me how exhausted I was going to be the next day. As I got older, the black dog got bigger and he started hanging around all the time. I'd chase him off with whatever I thought may send him running, but more often than not, he'd come out on top. Going down became easier than getting up again. So I became rather good at self-medication, which never really helped. Eventually, I felt totally isolated from everything and everyone. The black dog had finally succeeded in hijacking my life. When you lose all joy in life, you can begin to question what the point of it is. Now, for a lot of those who experience mental health issues, this analogy really helps understand illnesses. I used to think that words could never really describe that what was going on in my brain, but that video made me feel recognised and that my feelings were really valid. Um, so I will get on to explaining my journey, but first I'd just like to signify that mental health and mental illness is different for each individual. Therefore, my story may be completely different to someone else who may be struggling or going through or perhaps might face mental health in the future and that's okay both experiences that I have compared to someone else are just as valid as one another what we have to understand is the vastness and the variations which this illness pre presents itself when I was first ill I used to compare my journey to others and think well I'm not as bad as them so like what am I doing do I actually need help but in reality my experiences and torment from the illness was just as valid so please don't forget that if you are listening you are struggling the aim of me sharing my story is not for sympathy in any way shape or form but it is to showcase the experiences young people can face when suffering from mental illness and hopefully give a better insight and understanding into it um, and I'd just like to mention a quick trigger warning um, before I begin, as there'll be mentions of self-harm and suicide, and I won't be offended if you have to leave um, and not join this live. Um, so my mental illness started declining when I was in my second year at Wellington, which was my last school, um, and that was year 10. So I was about 14, 15 years old. Um, during this time, my mum and dad lived in Shanghai. Um, this detail will make a bit more sense later. But... Um, Prior to this time, I had faced some issues with self-harm when I was in year eight um, and this managed somehow to slip to the back of my mind and was no longer part of me um, for a while. 
So during the age of 15, I had settled into school. I loved my friends. I loved my boarding house. Um, but I often found myself during the second year um, putting pressure on myself to be popular, to look good all the time and comparing myself to a lot of other people. But as a grow girl growing up and like changing, you convince yourself that everyone feels the same and you're often told that they do and that it's just puberty and that everyone's emotions are like running up and down and it will just settle at some point. But the difference was in my case was that these thoughts kind of persisted and persisted and they just wouldn't leave my head um and as time went on my inner bully and inner self-critique began to take over the majority of my headspace and it got to the point where I was obsessed with my body and the energy I'd previously used to dance socialize and enjoy life was focused on my weight and the way I look compared to other people I began to truly hate myself, hate the world, hate school, hate my friends, hate my family. I was I was angry. I didn't have a specific reason to be, but I was just really, really frustrated with life. Um, there was also no words that I could use during this time to kind of illustrate how I was feeling um, and the anger just that I felt needed to come out with me. It was just building and building and eventually it all kind of toppled over. And that's when I picked up a, like the old habit of um, self-harm. Um, and for me, self-harming wasn't like about wanting to die or a cry for help. It was a physical way for me to process what was going on in my head. Um, but eventually this wasn't really enough for the thoughts to kind of go. So I started journaling and, and drawing. Sorry about that. So I started journaling and drawing and putting everything up here in my head onto the page. And I didn't make like I didn't care if it made sense or not. Um, I just had to let it go and find a release. Um, and like after a while of kind of doing that and working out what was actually going on my on all on and oh sorry my English is going out the window um working out what was all going on in my head and kind of keeping it a big secret from everyone just kind of hiding it away um my school matron actually found the journal and recommended that I see a school counsellor who then recommended to see a psychiatrist um and now for some people this would be like a relief because you know finally they didn't have to tell anyone someone found it for them and then made that those steps for them to get help but I was angry um that this has happened um and I'll tell you why it's, it's because everything and all my energy that I'd used to kind of keep this away from my parents was no longer able to happen because due to my age and like the concerns of other people they had to be made aware but as I said earlier, my parents lived in Shanghai during this time. So the depressive side of me knew that there wasn't much they could do from afar and that I could continue saying like, I'm OK, I'm fine over FaceTime. And this is what I've learned is like the thing is with depression is that no matter how much people are trying to help you, you're never going to appreciate it or deal with it until you're on the other side and like getting better. Um, so I had. I allowed the psychiatrist to share the minimum information as possible as he could to my parents um, and it kind of felt good for me because um, I could hide things away and I could just share the tiny little, little details so then I still have control over what you know what I can keep to myself and what I can keep doing to kind of I don't know um, hide my mental health um and forewarning me hiding this information didn't work out to my advantage um so I was put on medication I continued seeing the counsellor and I thought things were going to get better from there straight away um the thing is also with depression that I've learned is that you have to want to get better and genuinely try for the therapy and medication um to actually make an impact within your life so I then finished year 10. It was the summer holidays. Uh, I was still hiding my mental illness, telling everyone how much better I was. But over time, this accumulated into more thoughts about my body. And over that summer, I developed an eating disorder known as bulimia. The thing about um, bulimia is that to the outside world, you're quite normal. You eat your meals with a smile on your face and you say comments like, mm, this is this is really good or oh, I quite like that. Um, However, what a lot of people don't know is that as soon as you're done, you excuse yourself and you go to the bathroom. Um, and during this time, I looked really, really gaunt. And looking back on photos, it's, it's quite shocking um, to me. But the funny thing is that during this time in my life, I genuinely thought about how fat I looked. And the thing is with body dysmorphia is that it's that is like just so mentally hard to understand is that what I saw i.e the distorted morphed version of myself is the complete and utter truth in my head and so it kind of spirals into a worse thing um and no matter what anyone says um you know when you ask oh do I look good in this and people say you look great you look great um you convince yourself that they're lying 
And what many don't realise um, is that forms of continuous self-punishment and um, things such as self-harm and bulimia are forms of addiction. Um, you might be thinking like, oh God, addiction, really? Um, so what is addiction exactly? Addiction is defined as not having control over doing, taking or using something to the point where it could be harmful to you. Addictions affect the way you feel both physically and mentally. And these feelings can be enjoyable and create a powerful urge to do the stuff do the thing again um, and the stigma with self-harm and punishment and self-punishment is that it isn't seen as an addiction um, but it truly does take fight and willpower to be able to remove yourself so, from those forms of coping um, for example I have just celebrated being two years clean from self-harm um, my self-harm started when I was 14 15 so that's a five-year battle of fighting this um, so yeah, that's it's just an example of how long it does take to get out of this. Um, Self-punishment and self-harm are just as equally as addictive as the ones that are labelled as common, such as gambling, like drugs or, and alcohol. Um, so after I returned back from school after year 10 summer, I was in my GCSE year and my mental health had just plummeted. I began to lose, lose sight of why, why I was getting help. I didn't turn up to appointments and I began to think that no one was taking the time to understand and to listen to what I was trying to say. My counsellor, I felt, was the only person that truly tried to listen. Um, and I'm grateful that she kind of took me seriously. Um, but other aspects within school didn't. Um, I was often missing lessons, wasn't waking up for breakfast and not getting involved with aspects of school. Staff would email my house mistress or tutor saying I was manipulating people into not attending school. I began to kind of slowly disconnect from friends and drive them further away as they felt so hopeless trying to help. Um, there are many factors into why I attempted my life that October, but I'd be sounding it or talking to all you for quite some time, so I won't bore you with those details. All I knew was that I was alone and isolated and I had truly given up on everything and everyone around me. I think also the saddest thing for my mum looking back that October was um, that she had no idea she was blindsided. She was home from Shanghai for half term, but ended up staying a little while longer just to make sure I was okay. Um, and during my two uh, short two nights stay in hospital, I was visited by a CAMS assessment team um, who told me word for word, I've seen self-harm worse than that. And if you wanted to kill yourself, you would have actually tried. If you wanted to kill yourself, you would have actually tried. Now, in the, in the worst way possible, looking back, this subconsciously was what motivated me to prove a point that I genuinely didn't want to be here anymore. So I stopped seeing the school psychiatrist because he wasn't able to provide me with different medications. Um, and I changed to a new one in London. Um, she was in like a really fancy building in Marleybone. I don't know why. It might have been like the location and the fancy room she sat me down in. But I instantly thought that, oh, she's going to help me. Um, and within our first session, so within the first session, um, you get like a mental health score, a mental health like assessment. Um, and this is known as the PHQ-9 test. Um, it's basically an instrument for screening, diagnosing and monitoring and measuring the severity of depression. Questions are ranked from not at all to nearly every day and a score is produced. Scores can range from zero, non-minimal depression to 27 severe depression. Um, scores 20 and greater suggest severe depression and patients basically should go into um, psychiatric care and things like that and get referred to a mental health specialist um functionally the patient finds um it extremely difficult to perform life tasks due to their symptoms um now this was the first time i have ever gotten 100 uh in a test probably a bad test to score 100 percent in but here we are um then within our second session she decided to change my medication and i was so pleased to finally be listened to and taken seriously um what i didn't expect however was she suggesting an inpatient patient unit within our third session together my mum was not happy to say the least um the thing is when you mention the words inpatient to parents of a similar similar generation they immediately get ideas such as like a crazy cat lady or like everyone's in white gowns and it's like a prison um but just to let you know it's nothing like this um but I think both my me and my mum weren't really ready to admit how bad my depression actually was and that's also down to kind of me not sharing. So 
we agreed on waiting and seeing if the meds worked and I got better with the help of counselling, my psychiatrist and an eating disorder specialist who I was now referred to. Um, now, looking back, what I didn't realise was that the medication the psychiatrist had put me on was antipsychotics and adult medication. I wasn't psychotic, I was severely depressed. So this really manipulated the way my brain worked. Um, so from no the November to, to slash December time, um, right up to the fe February, I was like a zombie. I was disassociating. I wasn't remembering a lot of those months or what I said and did. Sometimes I'd zone out and come to realize that I'd self-harmed, but had no recollection. I lost a few friends from lying and not thinking straight just for being on another planet and this downward spiral messed up what I thought was real and what was not and it hindered my recovery process um the effect of this all built up together kind of caused a major depressive episode and deepened the suicidal thoughts and mindset and in the February I severely attempted my life I was in hospital for just over a week before being released home and awaiting a bed at an inpatient unit I have um many stories about being in hospital for those 10 days um but I kind of think I have one that kind of just illustrates how far gone my head was and how disassociated I was from reality and what was actually happening. Um, so it was obviously GCSE year when all of this happened. And during this time, I was in I was in hospital during our during our GCSE drama exam. Um, but I managed to convince the doctors, nurses, and my mum to let me go to this exam because mainly I didn't want to let my drama partner down, and I just didn't really process what had just happened to me um and I was a great actress at like the art of persuasion so they all let me go um somehow um so I turned up uh with my mum and a mental health nurse who I had to be with 24 7 and we all went on um along to the theatre and I just remember walking down the steps and everyone just looking at me like what the fuck is going on like I just walked in with a mental health nurse who had to sit at the back of the audience um I just walked in did a few scenes and left and I didn't see my friends after that for two months um and it was possibly the weirdest thing um I've done uh I can't really describe it but yeah it's just an illustration of how <laughs> weird my brain was at that time um so after waiting um a few weeks for a bed I was given a bed in a psychiatric unit in Maidenhead I was really lucky um because you can be given a bed wherever um in the UK so that kind of could be up to six to eight hours away um and during my stay I was told about the wrong medication I was put on the right ones and I began solo therapy group therapy and family therapy um this time my mum moved back temporarily from Shanghai and saw me every day during my inpatient stay um as well as being able to take some of my closest friends to come and see me too I'm lucky to have had that and I'm really lucky that I was able to get a bed and I'm also so lucky to found to have found the motivation to try and get better um and it was all kind of down to those few months of my life um after a month stay in the unit I discharged myself um I just wanted to see my friends my family and kind of regain my life back I found the energy to want to get better not for myself at this point um but for my family and those around me and that was kind of good enough for me at the time um my return back to school though was uh, strange I had one from a friend come up to me and say what the fuck I thought you were dead and I'm just standing there like mm, it's, it's not a ghost you see like hello it is me um and then another one came up to me and said oh I, didn't you hang yourself I heard that and it was weird I think it was the first time I realized how isolated I become from my friends and school and that kind of knocked my confidence a little bit but I overcame that and I managed to achieve a few GCSEs. I had an amazing summer and I returned back to um, lower sixth, so sixth form as a day pupil. I continued my CAMS therapy. I managed to go from being a day pupil to boarding again. And I spent my time rebuilding trust with my friends um, and my family. And it was the first time I felt that I genuinely wanted to get better for myself. Um, and that I needed a lot of time with my friends to thank them for being there um, for me throughout all of this. Um, and it was the first time I felt clarity and I felt grateful for having amazing supportive people in my life. And after 18 months of truly trying therapy, I was discharged. Um, there's like a really cute picture on my Instagram. Well, it's not cute. I'm crying. Um, but yeah, you can see it on my Instagram of that day. Um, and then over the summer of lower sixth uh, to the beginning of upper sixth, I reflected a lot about my journey, the ups, the downs and the stigmas I'd faced as a young person suffering. 
and I think it was during that period that I really recognized that mental health wasn't deemed like an open nor important conversations especially with com conversation especially within schools um and I wanted to be that change for our school um some of you watching may remember um or participated even um but in September 2019 I gave a speech talking about my experience um with mental health and then I organised and really participated in a 24 hour dance thon for Mind Charity. Um, it's still possibly one of the most memorable 24 hours of my life and we managed to raise over £3,000 for the charity. Um, doing this and talking more about my story um, inspired me further to want to do more and to kind of genuinely make mental health an open conversation within schools and change the way that schools handle mental illness. Um, so <laughs> you're probably wondering why, okay, what's the point? Um, so based on my experiences, I go around to schools and I talk about my experiences and I give insight into warning signs and um, how someone may appear to be struggling. Um, and ways in which family and friends can help and I think it's really important that you know I go through this experience I have to have learned something and what's the point of me not sharing that so I just want to kind of outline some warning signs that may help you if you are listening um yeah to, if, if you are worried about someone um it may really help so kind of warning signs that for depression um is often withdrawal from social situations um loss of involvement in previous hobbies so for me this kind of was I stopped kind of hanging out with friends quite a bit I would like to isolate myself a lot and my hobby used to be dance and like musicals and singing and all of that and that just kind of stopped I just stopped enjoying dance I stopped participating but the sad thing was, was that I actually really enjoyed it and when I did get better and I picked it up again I was sad that I didn't force myself to go um that's the thing with depression it can truly just take over the way you physically feel as well um more things are anger irritability irritability I, I remember just being angry all the time that people were forcing me to get help and people just didn't understand and the whole world didn't understand and I thought it was me against the world um I was also sleeping more frequently I had trouble concentrating within schools and lessons and again I had less contact with friends and family so these are all kind of the main reasons um, or main warning signs um, that you can spot in someone who is going through depression. It might not happen at first, you, you know, you might not get any of these or not any, sorry, that was about to say. Um, but you might not get like all of these, you might get some and it won't happen all at once. It will build up over time. The more you don't get help, the more it's going to build up and the more you're going to portray these symptoms. Um, and then eating disorder warning signs. Um, this, the thing is, is like, I'm not a therapist. I, you know, haven't been trained like this. I'm just basing these off my own experiences. So um, don't take this like word for word, but yeah. Um, so eating disorder warning signs, um, skipping meals, smaller portions, um, leaving straight after a meal. Um, this is like one of the main things for bulimia to watch out for is um, that, uh, as I said earlier, you kind of eat your meal and then you go off to the toilet straight away. When I was in the psychiatric unit, they had to, they shut the bathrooms for 30 minutes after we'd all eaten food because it's it's one of the most common things that um, someone would do if they were struggling with bulimia. Um, a restriction of certain foods. So suddenly cutting out like carbs um, and not really explaining why I'm doing this for like a prolonged period of time instead of just like a small diet. Um, or just not eating like sweet things or things above like certain calories. Um, frequent checking the mirror slash reflections. This was like a big problem for me when I was um, dealing with mine. Um, I would basically just be really fixated on checking myself and constantly body checking myself and staring myself in a mirror. Um, and it got to the point where it would be then reflections when we would be out in um, like shopping or something. I'd spot a reflection of myself. I would go back to kind of look at myself again um and it's things like that that you kind of really fixate on and it becomes like a habit um for girls um menstrual ir irregularities um this is kind of one of the first like big physical signs of an eating disorder um dizziness feeling faint and obviously there's fluctuations in weight and rapid weight de decreasing 
Um, so yeah, those are some warning signs that hopefully um, family and friends, if you are worried about someone, you find helpful. Um, but obviously, as I say again, I'm not a therapist. Um, these are just based on my own experiences. Um, but here are some ways you can help. Um, letting your friend know that you are there when they need to chat. I know this seems quite obvious, but sometimes just letting them know that this is an open space and you're going to be there and it, you'll validate their feelings. And validation of feelings is one of the most important things you can do. Um, saying not saying I understand because most of the time most people don't understand but saying that's okay to feel like that and it's okay to be angry and it's okay to be sad um and just making them feel like they're not isolated um even if you don't understand you validate that person to make them not feel so shit and so alone um try not to diagnose or sec second guess their feelings um sometimes it's really easy to say like oh yeah, I get that all the time, like, oh, I get depressed all the time, um, try not to, I don't know, just push them into a corner where they feel like they're not as, they're not, they're va the, sorry, again, my English is going out the window, um, where their feelings are not valid, again, um, don't push them into, you're just like everyone else, because you don't know the kind of ins and outs, so I think just accept what they have to say, and try not to, push like a generalized sentence onto them um, um ask how you can help in any way um often it's I, I think for my friends they didn't understand how they could help um and they often felt like I wouldn't say how I wanted help or how they could say things but I think now looking back them asking how they can help and like what they can do um really like can help the other person not feel so isolated and one of the ways that you can do this um instead of if you don't want to say how can I help say um I'd really like to come with you to seek some support or I'd really like it if we could go and chat to so like a teacher or an adult or so and so and know that that person will then know that you're there for them and you're not going to isolate them you're not going to go behind their back and tell a teacher um and that's another thing, being open and honest with that person is one of the most crucial things. Um, if your friend does come to you and is saying some really concerning things to you and you feel like you need to get someone else involved and get an adult involved and kind of help them get help, I think being open and honest about what you're going to do next is really important because one of the worst things you can do is someone tell you how they're feeling, you be really concerned, then you go behind their back and get help for them I think what you can do in that situation which really is what I tell a lot of young people is say to them I'm really really glad that you shared that with me and you were open and you felt that you could communicate this with me and I'm really proud of you for doing that what I'd really like to do though is maybe see if we can ask them for some help and I'll come with you during that session and I'll hold your hand and I'll be there for you so what that's doing is it's keeping the trust between you and a friend but then it's also not getting you so heavily involved because I think that a lot of the time for my friends is I think they felt a lot of pressure to help me and be that therapist but at the end of the day your therapist is a therapist your friend is not a therapist and there needs to be a distinct kind of line between there because then it, then it can all get kind of muddled up and I think for a lot of my friends they found it quite hard to be around me because they just didn't know how to help um so yeah being open and honest about going to seek help with that person um and just also making sure there's a clear boundary between friendship and being kind of someone as like a therapist um so um why am I like saying this why am I telling my story um what's the point of me being here um I feel that no young person should feel alone in what they're going through. I think mental health should be an open and easy conversation. Um, and I want to contribute to make sure that one day we don't have to have kind of mental health days in schools and have to have speakers in to get young people to talk about mental health. Um, I hope one day it'll be a natural part of everyday conversation and everyday society and schools. Um, I also want to reiterate that my story is one of many. Um, and you are not alone if you are struggling um and I also feel that what's the point in sharing this journey if I don't 
help others uh, what's the point in me having this information and kind of learning and reflecting about my journey and not sharing it with others um and most importantly I also want to reiterate that uh medication seeing a therapist um and getting help for mental health is not embarrassing um I believe I truly believe that mental and physical health should be treated just as equally as one another if you go to a doctor for let's say tonsillitis you go seek the doctor you get help you get put on antibiotics and you start the road to recovery if you like sprain an ankle you go to the doctor you might have physiotherapy um and then you're on the road to recover why is that journey easily understood but a mental health journey isn't and I really believe that hopefully having these conversations and inviting kind of people like me who really care about mental health onto these platforms and speaking about it um can really change that and make a difference um I mean, I believe that life can take you on many different journeys. Um, and the most uh, important thing that I can do or you can do is think about what it taught you. Um, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason, um, whether they're good or bad. Um, they change you. They help you grow as a person and you can learn so much about yourself. Um, so I just want to share a few things that I've learned. Um, I've learned that recovery isn't linear. It never will be. Um, you can relapse. You can have dips. and you're not back at square one um the thing is is that with mental health is that you think that it's once if you take one step forward and you take a million steps back like you're minus whatever but in reality when you first go and ask for help you take yourself about 100 steps forward so anything that declines from there you're still 99 steps forward than you were before and having that setback and having that step back even is okay and it's completely normal and I don't think we should have it ingrained in our mind that you just go from A to B and it's a straight line. Um, healing and recovery isn't linear and allowing yourself to kind of have that space to make mistakes is is really good for you and really beneficial. And it won't make you upset um, when you do face setbacks. Um, what you have planned for life should never be fixed. Um, I think it's just it says it does what it says on the tin really it's like if you expect yourself to do these most amazing things and you don't allow yourself to change perspective or allow yourself to grow and then think actually I don't want to do that um I think life will be quite upsetting and quite difficult I think giving yourself room to make mistakes and not plan for certain things um is really healthy I think you know for example I'm a uni student I'm doing a degree but I have no idea what, what I want to do afterwards and that's scary but it's also human and natural and not everyone has everything figured out even though they might seem like they do and knowing that is really good for you um it's okay to be emotionally vulnerable is one of the other things I say there's a lot to boys um and it's okay to cry and it's okay to feel like things and be open about it I think it makes you more human and it makes you more beautiful in my eyes anyway um medication for an illness is not weird or a weakness you take medication for, like for many other things it shouldn't be weird for you to be on medication for mental health um the way it's described is that it's a chemical imbalance in your brain and when you think of it physically you're like oh that makes sense but when it's to do with mental health it's like mm, well are you sure you want to go on medication da, da, da. but um I used to be really ashamed that going to like sleepovers and things like that and bringing like my little tub of like medication was so weird and I used to like sneak off to the bathroom and then take my medication but realistically it's not shameful I'm just on the road to recovery and that's okay um Another point that's really important is taking time for yourself and knowing that's not selfish. Prioritising your needs and what you want is not selfish. It's looking after your mental health, um, saying no to a night out, saying no to kind of doing like things that you just know you're not going to be interested in or they're going to make you tired and you're just not in the mood is OK. And it's not selfish. It's just prioritizing yourself is so good for self-care you know we talk about self-care about you know I'll put on a face mask go for like have a bath go for a walk things like that but prioritizing yourself and saying no is like an amazing form of self-care um finally um pressure will drive you over the edge 
putting pressure on yourself so for me for example putting pressure on myself to get better made me more stressed and actually didn't help my mental health and putting pressure on myself to be this person um that just isn't realistic for me um it's just not beneficial for my, my mental health I know it's easier said than done but um yeah I think just practicing um self-care and self-love and reducing that pressure on yourself can really benefit like be beneficial for your mental health and can give you more perspective on like wider things in life um finally I just want to add a little lightness to this talk um and thank you for those still listening um so here are some positives that come out of my mental illness and its journey um so I'm currently in my second year at Newcastle University um in 2020 I was a recipient of the Diana Award and I began working with them and appearing in media opportunities um from there I went on to receive the 2021 Diana Legacy Award which is the highest award a young person can receive for their contribution to social action um I've also just currently started working with a website called Teen Tips um, which is a re website I really recommend to schools and people if you're struggling. Um, they're a great resource page for help tips and provide information on many mental illnesses. Um, my favourite project though uh, at the moment is an organisation slash page that I've set up called Time to Talk. Um, it's at time dot to talk underscore I think I think. Um, it's basically a page that I've set up um, aimed at promoting the destigmatization of mental illnesses, as well as promoting understanding and awareness of various um, mental illnesses and conditions. Um, specifically within this page, I've also set up a series called Tea and Me, uh, where I have an open conversation with pupils or members of schools communi school communities about their mental health and their mental health journeys. Um, it's a really safe, collaborative and engaging space, which I'm so passionate about. And I hope if you check it out, you can all learn more about mental health and perhaps feel less alone. Um, ultimately, I do what I do because I think about the fact that if I was growing up in school and I had someone talking um, about the mental health who was older than me, I think I would have gotten help a lot sooner. So here I am being that person for all of you. Um, if you are struggling, uh, please just know that there are pe people more than willing to help and listen. Um, the hardest part is that first conversation, um, but I'm here to tell you to start it. Start the conversation, get help now, because I don't think young people should go through journeys where it takes attempts on your life to get people to realise that they need some help. Um, finally, I'd just like to share my uh, favourite quote. It's really cheesy, uh, I know, uh, but it's a quote that I used to tell myself um, after a bad day and I continue to tell myself and it's that tomorrow is a new day. Whatever, what events and whatever you experience today, um, the feelings you felt, they don't have to appear tomorrow. Uh, it's a clean slate, so use it while you can. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to add on my Time to Talk page that are some numbers and websites which I found useful when I was struggling um, and when I really needed help. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, and I will throw it out if anyone has any questions for me. But yeah, that's 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 me. Well, to be honest, I was actually so much lost in your story. And I would just like to tell you that we shouldn't label this story as a struggle story. It's more of a story of a fight against mental illness and i bet you've won it i bet you're winning it so about um, that part when you said that when you were suffering from mental illness you were journaling and one of your friends found the journal and they insisted that you should get help so my question is related to this like when you journal a lot of people say that when you're journaling you should use positive affirmations you should only input positive stuff so that when you go back to read those inputs you get some positive energy from it but a lot of people tend to just pour out their negative inputs like the struggle they're going through what depression is doing to them what anxiety is doing to them and what kind of things they're overthinking about so what is your take on negative journaling versus positive journaling? Would you would you rather put down all those negative self-harming thoughts in a journal or would you rather put positive affirmations for you to later go into? I think um, 
obviously positive journaling is like amazing but I don't think that you can be in that headspace when you're so depressed and you have so much anxiety and you have so much so many overwhelming thoughts I think it's really hard to think about positive things I know it sounds really bad but the thing that I learned about journaling is that if you're not talking about how you feel it just stays in your head and it doesn't go away and they just the thoughts just build up and build up and build up and then they topple over um because you haven't like released them you haven't got them out of your system you haven't spoken about them um but I think I think it's just um yeah I think it's just a case of it's great to be grateful I think one of the things as I was getting better that I learned is just writing three things that I'm grateful for that day um I think that's really great but I think you can't be so positive and like put those affirmations to page and really believe them if you're in a bad headspace you know the good thing about affirmations is that that to make them work you have to truly believe them and when you're in that headspace you can't believe them if you get what I mean but I think once you once you get that therapy you learn about these things and then you start implementing them into your life um so yeah I think it's I think it's just a case of where your headspace is at and whether you can truly believe what you're writing down and whether you truly see things positively well exactly thank you so much for that take now i would like to say that since you are very much putting the importance in seeing a therapist and it is definitely not an embarrassment at all but there are some therapists who tend to i don't know if it's if it happens in all of the countries but in our country i have friends who have went to therapists for their own mental illnesses and there are some therapists who just tend to guilt trip those people like they make it seem like it's your fault that you're into depression it is your fault that you're overthinking you shouldn't think that much so what is your take on like I went to a therapist and that therapist might be this kind of therapist. So what is my red flag, immediate red flag to realize that I shouldn't be in sessions with this therapist and I should look for a better one? Um, firstly, I'm really sorry that that's um, an experience for you and kind of your friends. Um, I think it's really hard to first know how um, kind of a therapy session is going to go. But I think you can kind of tell after the first session if they're saying things that you don't think are going to help you or they're saying things that you don't really understand and they're not explaining or taking the time to explain it. I think with a lot of connections that you make with people in general, you can kind of work out whether you're going to hit it off or actually enjoy this conversation that you're having. Um, I think that's a great thing about humans is that we can kind of tell that. And I think as soon as you feel that or feel uncomfortable or feel like, actually what she's saying isn't actually helping me and like she's not getting it she's not getting what I'm trying to say I think that's when you just call it off and you find another therapist I think you know for a lot of people it does take a lot of tries at different things and different types of therapy and different therapists and it's the same with medication it just takes time and it just takes allowing yourself to know that it's probably not going to work first time is okay um and not having the expectation that as soon as you step into like an office it's gonna work um yeah I think I think it's just gut feeling I think it's just a how you feel in that situation how that kind of room makes you feel how they make you feel and whether you actually believe what they're saying is truly trying to help you um and I think the guilt tripping thing is just a lot of it is that mental health is kind of still quite stigmatized especially within young girls um and a lot of the time therapists will talk about puberty and like things like that. But I think you know yourself that it is real and our experiences are real. Um, and I think as long as you have that self-assurance that actually this person has guilt tripped me and it's not working for me and I know I want to get help. So don't let that first deterrence like stop you from going to get more help. OK, thank you so much. And. I believe that definitely reaching out, a lot of people has their own way of opening up. Some people take time with a ter therapist as well. Like sometimes the therapist has a hard time making that person open up about stuff. So yes, definitely. And 
after the therapist question, this one is related to therapist too, which is you said that you when you took antipsychotic medication when you were on meds, um, you said that you had your brain worked in a different way. You had dis- disassociative events. And the question I want to ask you is that a lot of people doesn't want to see a therapist just because they are going to be assigned meds. They just simply don't want to take any medication, let alone antipsychotic medication. So what would you say to those people as an affirmation that meds is for it is for making you feel better? It is for your healing. It's not like it's going to make you more crazy or something. A lot of people think that, yeah, I'm going to go to therapist. It means I'm going to be labeled as a crazy person, which is like it's a social stigma and it's already implanted in a lot of people's brains so much that they're literally afraid to go see a therapist just for the sole reason that they're going to be labeled as a crazy person from the society. What would you say to those people as an affirmation that seeing a therapist is one of the most important process of the fight of depression or anxiety? Yeah, I would say, um, Firstly, that going to a therapist doesn't mean that you're going to be on medication at all. Um, also, the antipsychotic medication um, was because uh, the person that I went to see put me on the wrong ones. Um, and so that's not just something that's going to happen to you. It's just an experience of mine. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that therapy isn't... Um, because it's not psych- a, a psychiatrist. Or a, if you see a psychiatrist, then that's kind of when you get onto the conversation of medication. But therapy is completely different. Therapy is talking. Um, Therapy is a way um, for you to process your emotions and think about coping strategies um, and things like that. And so therapy isn't scary. Therapy is literally just talking. Um, It's a really simple thing that we all do every day. And it's, um, it's great. I think, you know, a lot of people also go to therapy, even if they're not depressed, um, just to talk about life issues and you know, if there's something troubling you or you can't quite get organized on like this one event and you need some help in structuring how to organize it, that's a way you can go to therapy for. And yeah, I think it's a bit, I think society and stuff is all a bit misled on what you what therapy actually is. Therapy isn't um, getting put on medication. Therapy isn't um, being a crazy pers- person. Therapy is literally just going to talk to someone and offload. Um, it's very similar to journaling but you're just saying out loud um yeah so I think that's one of the kind of misconceptions but I think if you are kind of scared about going to therapy I think just I don't really know I think it's just take your time first of all don't put pressure on yourself as I say um but research until you find a reason I think there are a lot of way like reasons online and a lot of pages that also promote therapy and things like that I think finding a reason and genuinely believing that this is going to work is the reason why you should go I think if you think it's not going to work then it won't um but yeah I think the whole crazy person idea I think it's um I don't think our generation um believe it at all I think our generation are very open to the fact that mental health happens um but I think there is a lot in like the media and things that kind of portray it, but you can't really stop the media. So I think just surround yourself with people that um, genuinely believe that you know, looking after yourself and your mental health is normal. Um, and I think affirmations such as I'm helping myself and um, this will be good for me. is like really important and this will make me stronger um, are really good ones. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, therapy is just talking basically is point blank <laughs> what I'm yeah, what I mean by it. Um and if you were interested in like medication, then you'd be passed on to a psychiatrist if you if they thought you needed it. But it's not necessarily a lot of people go through mental health journeys and don't have to take medication. Um but yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So basically knowing myself, like what kind of way should I actually go through like psychiatrist or therapy so thank you so much for that take and that was actually very useful so before we end I would like to ask you which is not really a mental health related question it is actually about Timberto 
what do you think about us a person like you who has worked so long and so hard about and on mental health basically reaching out to people trying to help them in from that inside what do you think about us um i think it's really good i think it's really nice to have people you know um where you have people kind of say their life stories i think that's really interesting um because as I say, like learning things and going through life and making mistakes and kind of reflecting on it and learning about yourself um, is a life lesson. And I think it's really great to hear other people's <clears throat> lessons based on their own experiences. And I think it's it's good to know that <laughs> mistakes are made pretty much everywhere around the world um, and young people, especially. It's powerful to see them like owning up to it. Um, and I think it's really great just to learn, hey, that person went through this and this is what they learned. Maybe I can kind of implement that into my life and what can I do about it? Um, yeah, no, I think it's really great. And also giving a platform, especially to someone talking about mental health is really important because not a lot of kind of people do that at the moment um, or give this amount of time to someone talking about mental health. You know, you often see like 10, 15 minute clips of it um, on big platforms. but um, it's nice to be given like as much time as I need or want to talk about something that really affects the majority of where I live and the world. Um, yeah, so I am really grateful. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's great learning about people's life lessons and what they really have learned. Thank you so much for all the compliments and acknowledging what we do. And basically what we try to do is making every life count making every story count because mm -hmm. even though this is not a grade five story of how you should be honest but every life story has a thing to learn from every life story has something to learn from even i'm losing words here right now and in case of mental health i want to tell everyone that make sure to self-pamper sometimes make sure to have some time to yourself and just take care of yourself like getting help going to people to get help seeking help always matters but sometimes you have to get out of your comfort space and make sure that you take care of yourself before you go out to anyone else so thank you so much Lottie it has been amazing to hear you talk even though it was on a pretty serious issue and we had a very deep insight from you but all of this were very useful very helpful and affirming and yeah. I definitely took some tips I'm gonna use them and I bet our audience did too. And again, we are so proud of you, Lottie. Keep doing the good work. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming here with us. Thanks. Do you want to say any last words before we close up? Um, just thank you for having me. I uh, hope everyone listening enjoyed, although it was quite serious. Um, yeah, I think it's good to sometimes have serious conversations, um, but hopefully um, it wasn't too bad for all of you. Um, yeah, but thank you for having me. And yeah, I think it's just really great. Keep talking, um, take that first step to make those conversations. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Like, even though it was a serious conversation while I was listening to your life story, I was, I felt like I was just listening to a friend. Like every day when I call up my friend and I listen to her, girl, what happened today? So it was that kind of story. Okay, so yeah. thank you so much again. And with that, we are going to close off the curtain for today. We have Lottie Leach, the absolute queen who fought mental illness. And I bet there are a lot of queens out there mm -hmm. like Lottie who is, well, struggling, but you can do it. You can get to the end. And just like I've started quoting from All the Bright Places, this is a book. Well, I'm ending with a book recommendation, actually. The book is All the Bright Places. This book actually portrays the issue of mental health very heavily. So if you want to have an insight, you can go for this book. And well, when it's about taking care of yourself, definitely take some time to take care of, take care of yourself. And it's COVID now. Oh, wait, mosquito, sorry. Well, it's COVID now, so to make sure you sanitize her, make sure to wear your masks. And just like you should stay away from toxic people who try to make fun of your mental health, stay away from COVID too. And that is about it. And another quote from All the Bright Places is that there is good in this world if you look hard enough for it. So keep looking. Don't stop looking. The good is waiting for you and you're going to find it. 
very very soon so that is it for today i hope you have a good night's sleep love yourself love myself peace thank you <laughs>